techniques get more into a numerical uh, approach. So what's nice about potential games, you could do a lot of analytical techniques, which we'll do. Okay, so um, oh, let me get to the next slide. Here we go. Uh, so some preliminary potential games were uh, discovered by uh, Mondera and Shapley. So Deb Mondera, Lloyd Shapley, um, famous Lloyd Shapley from Game Theory. Uh, they've been shown to be isomorphic to congestion games. Uh, computer scientists also use these to model internet congestion and uh, network analysis. Of course, use rational potential game theory. Uh, you could read that in Wolpert and others. Wolpert was actually at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, an analysis of certain boundedly rational potential games statistical mechanics. And I mentioned that about Anderson Gorey Holt in 2004. Uh, this is a discovery I made. It was uh, when I removed their mean field theory type of assumption from the quantal response. Uh, statistical mechanics has been deemed a viable model to address some important questions in economics. And you could uh, look at works where Brock and Durlaf uh, wrote a very famous paper on this uh, back in, uh, I think it was like the end of the 90s. Um, and it yields things such as emergence and scaling, and we'll show that here. So let's look at the game theory. Um, consider a finite number of agents, and these are fictitious decision makers. So these could be people, they could be firms, they could be computers, right, uh, with algorithmic trading and things like that. But ultimately, it's uh, some somebody or something who can buy or sell a good. We'll look at that. That's an example. We can, but don't need to imagine that each agent is located on a two-dimensional grid that we see over here. Uh, and the proximity doesn't have to be spatial. It could be example, agents who bid on the same contract we would be closest together. So that could be a company in LA and a company in Florida that are bidding on the same contract. They have more economic influence on each other than possibly two neighboring agents who have completely different um, biddings. So agents will label with the index I uh, in, in some G, which is a set of agents. Um, so at any moment in time, agent I can select an action or strategy, which we'll call XI from a set A of strategy decisions. So for example, if A were the set negative one, one, negative one could represent buying and positive one selling. Also, A could be an interval of real numbers, uh, representing the number of goods produced by a group of companies. You could have a low number and a high number. Uh, XI is agent I's decision variable. So if XI were negative one, that means agent I is buying. Now we'll talk about a configuration of the system. Well, that's just the set of all decisions, right? Uh, or an ordered pair of all decisions uh, at that moment. And so, for example, if we have the set of all negative ones at the second to the last line, that would be everybody is buying. If we look at the last line, we have some positive ones and negative ones, which means some agents are buying and some are selling. We'll call the set of all possible configurations omega, which is the product of the uh, A, which is called the pure state space. So that's just a space of, of all decisions that could be made. And then we'll give each agent will have a payoff function, which we'll call pi i. And notice each payoff is a function of all the other agent's decisions. And it gives the payoff agent i gets for a given state of the system. So for example, at the bottom, we see pi four with all ones uh, for, uh, for decisions gives agent fours payoff if everybody is selling in that last example I did. Now, here's where we start to get into humanomics. Uh, each agent will have an action function, AI, which is also a function of all the, config uh, the configuration or the decision variables. And it allows agents to control their behavior. So they can enact rewards and punishments towards other agents using this function. And just like the payoff, if we had A7 of all negative ones, that would be agent seven's action if everybody is buying. Remember negative one represent a buying state for it. This would be agent one is buying in the first position, 
The second position shows agent two is buying and so on. Now, as I mentioned, we're only gonna consider potential games. Now, what is that? It means we have a function V again of all the decisions such that every agent's action function AI satisfies the following. Well, the derivative of their action function with respect to their decision variable, notice the A has an I and the X has an I, so it's the same agent. Uh, that is equal to the derivative of this potential function with respect to agent I's decision. So the potential gives uh, is a sort of an aggregation of all the differences of agents payoff. It's a global function that you could get uh, agents uh, changes in their decisions from. Um, so for those of you, might, I mean, this uh, derivative, right, is a change in the decision AI with respect to decision XI. And uh, let's see here. So the dynamics for the game, therefore using this idea, uh, we can, Sorry, can I, do, yes. Can I ask a simple clarifying question on the previous slide? Because I, so the V function doesn't have a sub index I, right? No, so it's a, a global function. And so does it have more arguments than, than the AIs or why is no. the told or is that a condition? I'm sorry if I'm very ignorant, it's a very basic question. That's okay, yeah, it's, a, it's the same arguments. So it's all the decision variables for each agent. Okay, and that and that uh, the partial derivatives are only with respect to the own decisions, so like. Uh... Yes, so yeah, it only, right. So for each I, so if I had uh, one, it would be DA1 DX1 equals DV DX1. For two, it'd be DA2. So now we're talking agent two, a different action function, action function two with respect to DX2 would be DV DX2 and so on. Okay, I see, thank you, yeah. So yeah, you can recover the, the derivatives. And what's um, th this was in this paper by Shapley, right? And he shows the, uh, now this is not all games satisfy this obviously, right? But Shapley showed these are, and, and Mondera showed these are isomorphic to congestion games. Uh, but it's pretty robust. There's a lot of research going on uh, on potential games. Uh, and they're used in uh, computer science and quite a variety of things. Um, so let's look at the dynamics. Why do we want to look at those uh, derivatives? Well, think of this, D, uh, agents are gonna follow the maximum action direction. So if the action were just the payoff, what is this saying? DXI on the left in this red square, uh, that tells you how is agent I gonna change their decision? Well, what they're gonna do, they would look at their action or say their payoff, and they would, they would move it in the direction that it's increasing, right? If you look at the derivative, if the derivative's increasing, they're gonna adjust their payoff in that direction. Why? Because they'll get more payoff. If it's decreasing, the, the derivative will be negative. They're gonna decrease their decision because again, their payoff will increase, right? So this is a myopic dynamics. They're only looking locally, right? Uh, derivatives, uh, when you're looking here, dx, indicates you're only looking locally, you're making a small change in direction. So this would be a myopic model. And we'll assume that's reasonable uh, because in a um, decision space, usually uh, agents don't have a lot of information about decision space. If you think in all the restaurants in the United States, um, uh, a restaurant in Los Angeles does not know what a restaurant in New York, in Wisconsin, in Florida are doing, right? So usually they only have partial information. So it's reasonable to assume uh, they're gonna make decisions that are myopic, uh, that, that are gonna be small changes from what's going on at that moment in time. Um, now we can put all this together with a potential uh, up in blue at the top, we can replace DAI DXI with DV DXI. So then what we get are these DXs, uh, are equal to dv dx times dt. And so in other words, the change in decisions follows the gradient, what's called the gradient of the potential. Now, if we look at this to the right, imagine the square on the bottom is decision space and up above is the potential. 
Well, you can see which way they're going to want to move. Uh, if the change in potential equals a change in payoff, well, it's going to increase if you move towards the center of the square, right, from any direction. So agents will move, and you can see the little arrows on there. Agents will move towards the center because their payoff will keep going up if they do that. Now, when they hit the top, the derivative will be zero. They'll stop moving, right? They'll have reached a maximum. And so the agents are moving myopically in that direction. So this is rational dynamics, and this is studied quite a bit um, uh, out there in, in, in economics, actually. Uh, so what we're going to do is apply bounded rationality. Uh, and why? Because agents don't always have exact information due to random error. Um, bounded rationality, uh, the errors are due to failures to choose most optimal payoffs and are intrinsic to agents. We'll actually show that I, I should change this. It could be extrinsic to agents too, as we discovered in this uh, with the work with Vernon. Um, examples are experimentation. Sometimes people will experiment, right? They may not, they may think, oh, I should do this, make this decision, but I want to try something different and see what happens. Well, why is that they have lack of complete information? Um, so they don't know what will happen if they make a different decision. Unlike classical economics, it assumes agents do know what will happen. Um, sometimes they want to maintain the reputation of a product. So they won't sell it at a lower price. They'd rather lose money. And I know this, I'm a wine judge. And some wineries will do this, right? They will not sell for a lower price. They'd rather dump some of the wine. Uh, uh, and uh, not sell at all, then lower their price. In the fashion industry, some will do this too. It's called fast fashion. There's literally an article, I think in the New York Times about one company burning their excess clothing because they did not want it to sell for a lower price. So they're clearly taking a loss. That, that is not quote rational quote uh, behavior. Although Vernon would argue the opposite because he, he had told me once, well, they have a, a reputation to maintain. But in the sense of classical economics, to lose money uh, like that, um, you know, if you're just following a profit function, that is not rational. Uh, mistakes in judgment, right? Sometimes people just make mistakes in their judgment. Uh, maybe if you've read Kahneman's book on thinking, fa thinking fast and slow, right? people use their system one, uh, which is more based on intuition and heuristics. And uh, so they won't use rational thinking. They'll just use heuristics or, or, in, or instinct to make a decision. So those are some motivations. So how are we going to model this? Well, we'll use what's called a Wiener process, which I won't get into the technical details here, but I'll show you a picture of it. It's basically a random process, right? So at every moment in time, uh, it's going to be continuous. So you make continuous jumps up and down at random times. And we can see here, uh, the horizontal line here is zero, right? So the random component will be positive all the way up to about time four and a half. Around four and a half, it goes negative. And then uh, about four and three quarters, it goes back up positive. And what we're gonna do is add this randomness to the decisions. So here's the stochastic dynamical model. Well, notice these first two terms, the dx in the triangle V, the gradient of V, DT, this is what we had before with my uh, rational myopic dynamics. Now we're going to add DW, which is a, that random component, right? The randomness. And we'll put a parameter in front of it called nu, which is a fluctuation of variable that allows us to adjust how much influence the random part has. If we put nu equal to zero, this would be a rational model, right? Because it would zero out the random term. If nu gets large towards infinity, very large, well, then the random part dominates and agents are just behaving randomly without any rationality, right? They're making random decisions. This last part is just a boundary term. It keeps everything within a certain um, range of decisions. For example, if you're a company producing goods, you can't produce negative goods, a negative number of goods. So this last term will keep the process, uh, say, from zero up to some maximum number, you can make it so it won't go above a maximum number as well. So if you're talking like a percentage output, it would be between zero and one. This last term will keep it between zero and one because the random part might add a lot to it, right? Too much. Well, this last term will fix that. And um, 
this actually, this has a stationary state, this dynamical model. Um, but before I talk about that, I'm gonna talk about that since there's randomness here, we get a probability density function on decision space. So now before we could say all agents were buying or all agents were selling. Well, now we don't have that because we have randomness. So there is a probability now that all agents are buying, but there's also a probability all agents are selling. And we don't, we can't say they're doing one or the other for sure because of this randomness. So at any moment in time, they are doing one, but that moves around with some randomness. And if we track that, we get a, a probability density function. So if it were 50-50, there'd be a 50% chance everyone's buying and a 50% chance everyone's selling if we restricted to those two states, for example. Um, so f of xt gives the probability that agents make decisions represented by x at time t. f changes over time, but will reach a fixed function in the long run called an equilibrium measure. And why does it reach this? You could read the paper by, um, um, actually you could read it, um, I think I cited on the next one, Kang and Ramanan uh, proved this in 2014. And, which is funny because I was using this result back in 2005, right? This was actually shown, a looser version of this was proved in um, Anderson Gorey Holt's paper, uh, but with free boundary conditions. And I started trying to prove this for uh, when you had boundary conditions and you wanted to restrict decisions, like I mentioned before. And that was, that was tough. So I was starting to learn about stochastic processes. And uh, I kind of shelved that for all, luckily, because this is like a 50 page paper that they proved this thing in. Um, so I didn't have to do all that work, thank goodness. So let's talk about what they showed. Well, here the evolution of that density function follows this differential equation called a Fokker Planck equation, a partial differential equation. And when it's zero, you have a stationary state because why the decisions, your, your density is no longer changing in time. And so you get a stationary density. Now it will reach us in the long run. Again, this was shown way back, even in Anderson Gorey Holt's paper, because there's a Lyapunov function for this, which is the free energy from physics, right? So it's, or you could say constrained maximum entropy. So the Gibbs state is the stationary state. And again, proved rigorously in Kang and Ramanan's paper. Now, this is very interesting because this looks just like statistical mechanics. Um, what we see on the left is two over nu squared. Now, remember nu was that parameter in front of the random part. When nu was zero, it was zeroed out. The random part was perfectly rational. Uh, v is the potential. While in statistical mechanics, we have one over kt times e of x, where e is the energy and a negative sign. So we see a relationship, temperature is proportional to nu squared. So this is actually a fluctuation dissipation theorem in physics. And the energy is equal to the negative of the potential. So um, the analogy of a boundedly rational potential game uh, to statistical mechanics is as mentioned, uh, nu squared is proportional to temperature and the potential is a negative of the energy. Now, if you think about this, uh, the more randomness, remember as nu gets higher, nu squared will also get higher. Well, then t gets higher. So higher randomness, uh, higher randomness means higher temperature um, or higher noise and decisions, right? The higher that nu squared was, the more randomness affects decisions. Decisions are noisier. The lower the temperature, the lower the noise and decisions. So temperature is a measure of the noisiness of decisions. Uh, when you have no noise, that's perfect rationality. So now let's take all this machinery and apply it to humanomics. Uh, what we need for humanomics is something extra. We need a gratitude configuration. And uh, gamma ij will represent the gratitude or resentment agent i has for agent j. And so we'll visualize uh, this as a bond between sites I and J. Remember, we kind of put uh, agents I and J at two different points on a graph. 
well, we can draw a line between them. And that line, depending on its the value that line carries, uh, will represent whether those agents have mutual gratitude or mutual resentment, or if they're just operating in a self-interested way. And so the value for mutual gratitude will give it a one, for mutual resentment will give it a negative one, and for self-interested behavior will give it a zero. Now, more generally, we could assume there, it doesn't have to be mutual. We could assume that agent one has gratitude for agent two, but agent two resents agent one. So that would be a non-homogeneous gratitude state. Uh, we're not gonna consider that because to get a potential, it has to be mutual. And if you read humanomics, that's not too much of a, a giant assumption because often a more stable state is that there's mutual gratitude or mutual resentment. You typically get reciprocation, right, in general. Um, of course, that could be an interesting thing to model when it's not. Uh, and again, you would not have a potential. You'd have to use quantal response uh, type uh, measures to study that. But we'll keep it mutual for now, since that's a reasonable assumption and it makes the analysis easier. Now, we're also going to have two time scales: uh, one for economic equilibrium, which is where we get the stationary state we mentioned before. And then we have another time scale for feelings of gratitude and resentment. So for example, if you have fast, high frequency traders that make decisions at microsecond time, well, your gratitude or resent for somebody is not gonna change much, is not gonna really change during that short period of time. Uh, gratitude or resent might change more on maybe a daily basis or an hourly basis. You can model it to be longer, but it would certainly be, uh, it wouldn't be changing uh, in microseconds. I mean, you would, probably be crazy if your attitudes are changing that quickly, right? You would be a very unstable <laughs> person. So that doesn't really happen. Um, so again, we have strategy variables, as we mentioned before, we have a payoff function, uh, as we mentioned before, and we have action functions, as we mentioned before, I'll mention the action allows agents to reward and punish other agents when prompted by gratitude and resentment, and it can also reflect self-interested behavior. And I'll explain why. We're going to restrict ourselves to quadratic payoffs. Here's some formulas that are examples of quadratic. By quadratic, notice I mean uh, x is multiplied. Remember, uh, quadratic equations are second degree in x. Well, the degree of these, both of these equations are degree two. Um, this lower one's a little different. It's a quantity price type payoff. And you see these in Corno models and um, speculator hedger models, uh, where an X can be factored out, XK can be factored out. Uh, let's talk about the action function now. So we're going to take those quadratic payoffs. Now, an action function is going to be a sum. And we're going to take uh, the payoff of the other agents weighted by the gratitude configuration gamma IJ out in front of the payoff. Uh, let's look at some examples of this. Now, if AI were pi i, um, well, that means all the other gammas are zero. We'll assume gamma i i is always one. In other words, an agent uh, always has gratitude for themselves. They're not going to act against their own interests. Um, so if all the gammas were zero, we have self-interested behavior. Agent i's action is to maximize only their own payoff and they don't really care about other agents. Now, if gamma i were not zero, if the, if the gamma ij's were not zero, if say they were plus or minus one, if they were plus one, let's say we had two agents, so agent i and agent j, well then action i, agent i's action would be their payoff plus agent j's payoff. If they, um, and we'll show why, uh, if you add, that will actually improve the other agent's payoff. Uh, now that requires certain correlations to hold, which we'll, uh, we'll look at in a moment. Now, if gamma is negative one, now notice agent I will have their payoff minus agent J's payoff. So they're trying to maximize their payoff minus agent J. So it's having a minimizing effect on agent J's payoff. So they're punishing agent J if there's a subtraction. And uh, this is where we, um, actually can um, recover this lost information I talked about at the very beginning. Um, 
So this form is for aligning ferromagnetic interactions on the footnote below. It was shown in our paper for opposing interactions or so-called anti-ferromagnetic in physics. The addition and subtraction of payoffs can be, in other words, adding payoffs can be punishing and subtracting payoffs can be rewarding, which is the reverse of what we're talking about here. So how you punish and reward depends on the structure of the game, which is what we showed in our paper. But we will assume agents learn this with repeated experimentation they'll learn how they can control their action to result in reward or punishment towards other agents. And um, this is kind of in the spirit of even mean field game theory, where it uses a control theory approach where agents control their decisions. Uh, it's not quite at the level we're doing it here. We're doing it uh, in a much more sort of, um, general method, uh, but you could look into that. That's an interesting approach. Let's look at a two-person aligning game. Now, why is this called aligning? Because this interaction J that we see in both of these payoffs is positive. Um, if J were negative, it would be um, anti-aligning or opposing or anti-ferromagnetic in, in physics. Physicists would call this ferromagnetic system. And why is that? Because if you remember, um, well, we'll see the potential. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that when we see the potential for this. Now, this is what we call interaction heterogeneous because why the H1 and H2 are different. Now, pi one is agent one's payoff, pi two is agent two's payoff. So notice the interaction between them is the same, but they're, uh, these H's, the linear terms are different, can be different. Our gratitude configuration is a single variable. Now we'll only consider minus one and positive one. So agents will be interacting with each other. So therefore they will either have gratitude or resentment. Later we'll compare that to when they act in just self-interest. Now here's the potential V and you can verify the derivative of this with respect to X1 equals a derivative of payoff one with respect to X1 and the same for payoff two. Now, why do we call this uh, ferromagnetic or aligning? Because remember the Gibbs measure is roughly E to the power V. That's the probability. And notice that's gonna be higher when X1 and X2 are the same sign because J is positive. And that will be E to a positive number, which is larger than E to a negative number. So there's a higher probability when X1 and X2 make are the same sign, right? Either both positive or both negative, their product will be positive and therefore they will have a higher probability. Uh, so that's why it's called aligning. They have higher probabilities are given when they make the same decision. Um, now we need gratitude to deal with this gratitude variable we're gonna assign a probability. We're gonna say agents have mutual gratitude with probability P, and therefore there's gonna be mutual resentment the rest of the time, which is one minus P. So if P were one half, they would have gratitude, mutual gratitude half the time, and mutual resentment the other half of the time. If P were, 0.25, they would have mutual gratitude a quarter of the time and mutual resentment three fourths of the time. So P is the empirical frequency of mutual gratitude. Um, so like before, we get the uh, Gibbs uh, measure, there's that E to the beta V. Uh, a partition function, we're gonna use this, it's a generating function. It can be used to calculate mean payoffs and probability theory, right? Um, the free potential is actually the generating function. If you take derivatives of this F function in blue, you will get mean values for different variables. And so let's take a look at that um, in a moment. Uh, but first, before we do that, we're gonna talk about, we have this probability measure, so we can get the expectation of a function with respect to this probability measure. So let's say agents, an agent's payoff. Well, remember there's a probability agents can be in any state. So we wanna take the average over all those states. To, to the, so we're talking about average probabilities of payoff. So we need to take averages and we will use that Gibbs measure to get averages. 
But we need to go a step further because once we take the average with respect to the Gibbs measure, that's with respect to the X variables as we can see on the far right in red, there's still this gamma variable. So since over economic decisions in equilibrium, remember we assume fast traders, gratitude stays constant. So gamma is a constant in the red equation. Um, but over longer periods of time, that can change. So we're gonna take another average over the probabilities with respect to the gamma variable or gratitude and resentment. Remember we said if it were half and a half, there would be resent half the time and gratitude half the time. So we're gonna take half and half of each of the states above where they uh, have gratitude and where they have resentment. So we need to average over that as well. Uh, oops. So that is actually a quench mean in, in statistical mechanics. This is exactly what you do with a spin glass model. So right away, we see when we make these assumptions, we get a spin glass model in statistical. So here we go. Remember, I said we can use that generating function to calculate average payoffs. Well, the average payoff for player one up on the top in red Turns out we get this function here, and that's the hyperbolic cotangent in black. Uh, for agent two, we get this function here. Now this is when gamma is negative one, which is resentment. When it's not negative one, it's much harder. Why? Because negative one zeroed out the um, quadratic terms. If we go back, see the potential? See how it's one plus gamma up above in red? Well, when gamma is negative one, that's a big zero and the quadratic part goes away. It's easy to integrate the rest of this. Um, when gamma is not one, we get more complicated expressions. And we can see here, we just need to use these to compute payoffs. So up on the top third, we have the expected value of X1, X2. In the middle, we have the expected value of X1. On the bottom, we have the expected value of X2. Well, that's all we need to compute the expected value of payoffs. Um, so how do we do that? We see at the top, the average of pi one of player one will be by linearity, we get this function here. So, and for payoff of agent two, again, we get the same thing. So you can see, we only need those three expectations for X1, X2, X1, and X2. Well, now that we uh, can get those, we want to take the average over the gamma variable, or the quenched payoffs over gratitude and resentment. And we're gonna put a bar above. So we're gonna write that as pi one bar and pi two bar. And um, really all we need to do is weight the uh, resentment by the probability of resentment and the gratitude average with the probability of uh, gratitude. And let's look at some numerical results. So that's basically how to set up the model. We'll take some specific results, J equal to four, H11, and H26. Now I'll point out since H1 is lower because of correlations, agent one will have lower payoff. H2 is higher, so, uh, it's six. So agent two will have higher payoff in these type of aligning models. And uh, gratitude uh, will be a, a one and resent will be a negative one, as we mentioned before. So here's the first graph, and this is very interesting. It's the average payoff we see on the left on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, we see beta. Now beta is one over the temperature. So since it's the reciprocal of temperature, remember we said higher temperature was more random, less rational. Well, that means um, uh, higher beta is more rational. It's the opposite. Lower beta is more random. So here we're taking uh, mutual gratitude and mutual resentment to be 50-50. And we see these payoffs at beta equals zero down in the lower left corner at zero, zero. Uh, behavior is purely random and all payoffs are zero. Um, why? Because uh, the X's become decorrelated and their averages uh, from negative one to one are zero. As beta goes to infinity, the payoffs approach the Nash equilibrium. Remember, beta approaches infinity, temperature approaches zero. And um, if you follow the gradient of the potential, you go to the maximum of the potential. 
And it was shown in, uh, well, that's kind of well known in Shapley's paper, the maximum of the potential is a refined Nash equilibrium. Uh, but it turns out, and it's proven in our paper, you can see on the far right, these curves are converging. And in fact, at infinity, they all converge to the same thing. And let me explain these curves. The lower curve on top, the red one, is the punishment, mutual punishment payoff. The blue one up on top is the mutual gratitude payoff when agents are working together. So you can see there's higher payoff. The black one is their average, their 50-50 average. So this is what you, the black one you expect on average. So you can see when agents uh, have gratitude for each other, they have higher payoff. When they resent each other, they work against each other, they punish each other, have lower payoff. Well, when it's perfectly rational, this doesn't work. The payoff for mutual gratitude and mutual resentment are the same, right? So changing your decisions is not gonna matter in this particular model, uh, whether you have gratitude or resentment. So we see corollary, the Nash equilibrium has no predictive value in this particular model. Uh, so we have to go to the Gibbs measure. We have to go to the left of infinity and we see it's doing what it should in this region. When there's mutual gratitude, they work together, they reward each other and they get higher payoffs. When they punish each other, they get lower payoffs. Um, we also see there's a learning curve, right? These curves are concave. So there's decreasing marginal gains as knowledge increases. So this is very interesting. Uh, as beta increases, remember, as we go to the right, agents are getting more rational. How do they get more rational? Well, they put in work to get more information about the system. It takes effort. And we see the gains are really strong at the beginning. They, it goes almost straight up, but then it starts leveling off. So the more effort they put towards getting more information to be rational, uh, more rational, the less the payoff is. So we see bounded rationality could actually be due to intrinsic properties of the game, namely diminishing rewards for higher rationality. So what are agents gonna do? They're gonna stop. They're gonna stop being more rational. And they're gonna say, well, I've learned 60% of what's going on. That's enough. I don't need to learn more because it's not paying off. So that's an interesting result. Um, so we see information is lost about this also in the Nash equilibrium, since all those curves uh, converge. Uh, this was also outlined in a paper in the footnote at the bottom by Donald Sari and uh, Dan Jesse in 2016, found information is lost when use, using Nash or quantal response. Um, the lost information and quantal response is recovered here uh, using through rewards and punishment. Uh, let's look at another curve. This is the quenched and self-interested payoffs versus temperature. So now we're gonna go back to temperature. So now as we go to the right, this is more random behavior. As we go to the left uh, on the graph, it's more rational behavior. And we can see they all converge at the top. Um, and these are the averages, remember, over uh, gratitude and resentment. So we see here for different levels of um, gratitude and resentment, uh, the curves on top are for agent one, the blue and the black, the curves on the bottom, green and red are for agent two. And we see these dotted curves, uh, the blue ones are getting higher. Well, that's as um, P gets larger, right? They're getting higher. So as agents have uh, the, uh, as the, the probability or the proportion of mutual gratitude gets higher, the payoffs go up. So down at the bottom, this dotted curve, this dotted blue curve is when P is 0.2 or one fifth. So that means there's mutual gratitude one fifth of the time and mutual resentment four fifths of the time or 80% of the time. So 80% of the time they're punishing each other and losing money. So you can see why the mean payoffs are the lowest. As we go to the top one, the solid blue curve, we see that's when P is 80%. So on the top one, agents reward each other 80% of the time. 80% of the time, there's mutual gratitude. Now, the black one is interesting. That's self-interested behavior. That's when the agents do not interact. And what we see is something very interesting. Uh, 
if there's too much punishment, it's better just not to interact with the other person, right? To not reward and punish and enter into any interaction with them. It's better just to be self-interested and maximize your own payoff. Uh, when the gratitude gets high enough, your payoffs can outweigh the self-interested case, as we see with the higher blue curve that's solid. And the same goes for agent one. Now let's look at this. Uh, there's gonna be a critical value where this happens. Let's average over temperatures. So let's take an average of the payoffs across all temperatures. Say we don't know how rational it will be at any given time. Let's make an assumption that, you know, uh, agents are between zero and 15 temperature uniformly. In other words, the same probability, it's like rolling a die. Same probability they'll be at any one of those degrees of rationality. So we're gonna take an average of these, of these payoffs, the payoffs where they interact and the payoffs where they're self-interested over the different temperatures. And what we see here is we get this curve here. Now the black line again on top is the self-interested uh, payoff uh, over the average of these temperatures for agent one. Notice agent one has higher, uh, or agent two, I'm sorry, the top is agent two. Agent two has higher payoff uh, than agent one. And notice that um, this tilted curve, right? The, the slope curve is the um, quench payoff when they interact. Now, there's a point here where these intersect. So what's going on there when they intersect, they're making the same amount of money when they act in their own self-interest and don't interact as when they do interact. Now, when you go to the right, you see the blue curves above the black curve, it pays to interact. So we see um, there's a critical P on the bottom, the horizontal axis is P, and notice that probability here where these curves intersect at the top is about 0.553. Well, that means there has to be mutual gratitude 55% of the time for agents to want to interact with each other. If it's below that, they make less payoff. They're not gonna interact with each other. They're just gonna act separately in their own self-interest. So we see there's risk aversion here, right? So the, uh, it's not P equals 0.5 where this happens. If it were 0.5, they'd be indifferent to the amount of uh, gratitude and punishment. So we see agents will not engage with each other until there's more than 50% of um, mutual gratitude. So they have an aversion to resent. Uh, now notice agent, agent one at the bottom it's even farther, the intersection's farther to the right at 0.597 or about 0.6. Uh, we can see it's above about 0.6. So agent one with lower payoff is even more averse to resentment. Agent one will not engage with agent two till there's about 60% mutual gratitude. Um, so this is uh, sort of consistent with um, axiom four in humanomics that agents are averse to resentment. And it also shows that there's uh, agents with more money are willing to take more risk, right? They will jump in. If there's more resentment, they're willing to risk it. Well, it makes sense because they have more money. It's not gonna uh, affect them as much. Well, this is not built into the model. It's just the property of this model. What's interesting, if you take very high temperature, they are not risk averse. Remember, they start getting more random and non-rational. These intersections can happen over at like 0.3. So that means agents uh, will engage each other when there's a lot of resentment, if they're non-rational enough. So this is a current area of study is where does that cutoff occur at 0.5 um, at what temperature? So in the conclusion, what have we introduced? A simple tractable model that implemented fundamental elements of humanomics where mutual gratitude and resentment with reward and punishment in the form of higher and lower payoff. Uh, we included bounded rationality and also time scales for economic equilibrium and feelings of gratitude and resentment. We see that this is a quenched model uh, with faster economic equilibrium, uh, which gives new insights into critical quench probabilities. Uh, in spin glass models, uh, they don't read nearly as much into these probabilities, 
uh, they have much more meaning, say, in these models than they do in physics. Um, the, uh, they carry more information here. Uh, we see agents are resent diverse, consistent with axiom four. And we see the Nash equilibrium does not have any predictive power for this particular aligning model. Uh, so we have to use uh, the Gibbs measure, right? Um, infinite agent homogeneous interaction model if all the H's were the same would be exactly a spin glass, but it's a little different than a spin glass in physics. The disorder comes from random high temperature behavior, not frustration. Frustration means the signs can get negative. In this model, we did not allow the signs to get negative of the interactions, um, but the result is for high temperature behavior, um, you, you get effectively higher temperature or more randomness, which creates disorder, which is different than the frustration of classical spin glasses in physics. What are some areas of future research? Uh, create a model where the time scales of economic equilibrium and feelings of gratitude resentment are the same, and these might interact. Um, the, the variables of gratitude resentment uh, and the economic variables would interact. Uh, a spin glass, infinite agent homogeneous interaction uh, model. Uh, to do more research on that, and, and my guess is it has a phase transition. Uh, what is that phase transition in this model? That would be interesting to study. What does it mean? Um, in similar models, as I mentioned, we, we discovered flash crashes, right? So I wonder what that would be in this model. That would be worth looking into. The anti-aligning models, when J is less than zero, well, those are when agents want to do the opposite of what other agents do. Like in a Corno model, if everybody's buying, you want to be a seller, right? You want to do the opposite of the majority. Um, how about an aligning model like we did with three, four, five, or six agents? Probably have to be done numerically. Do similar results hold as n equals two in this paper? Finally, to look at homogeneous gratitude configurations where the gratitude and resentment need not be mutual, could be one-sided. Uh, that might be an aberrational case, but it might be interesting. And that ends the talk. Serge, to thank Mike for uh, for excellent presentation, and um, please stay in touch. And uh, thank you. Absolutely, it's my pleasure, and thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you.